everybody, it's Kamal Fernandez here from Kamal Fernandez Dog Training, continuing in my series called Lifting All Ships. Lifting All Ships, or the saying Lifting All Ships, comes from the mantra or the, the, the saying, uh, a rising tide lifts all ships. And as we are all, uh, as a collective, if we can uh, pull together and lift each other up, hopefully we will get through this testing time uh, as a whole. Um, and that's something that I've been reaching out to fellow dog trainers, um, professionals in the industry of dog training and beyond to seek their advice and their guidance about how we can um, help ourselves, help our dogs and therefore help each other to navigate this um, very surreal moment that we are all across the globe um, going through. The person I'm talking today is the world-renowned Sharad Patel, probably one of the nicest people you'll ever likely to meet, um, very well thought of, very well respected, incredibly knowledgeable and has a vast array of experience from everything from, you know, rodents to uh, marine mammals, a very well-versed um, animal trainer, behaviourist, whatever you want to call him. But most importantly, he's from my neck of the woods, East London. Whee! So um, big shout out to the East London. So, Shirag, how are you keeping? How are you? And you are clearly are not in East London at this current time if anybody <laughs> follows you on um, the interweb. So what area are you and how the hell did you end up there? <laughs> I'm doing amazing. Um, and thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I also love the whole community aspect of this. Um, yeah. I'm currently in North Carolina in the States. Um, so I came here for Clicker Expo. Um, I was speaking at Clicker Expo this year and then Expo got cancelled. Mm -hmm. And so um, Teresa McKeon from Tag Teach was like, come over to my house, we'll hang out. <laughs> yeah. And so I drove over to her house. Little did she then... know. <laughs> You're not yeah, leaving. Exactly. Little did you know, yeah. you'll be here for the next four weeks. Yeah. So well, while everyone's in lockdown, uh, what nicer place to do lockdown yeah. than um, Teresa's beautiful farm? How amazing is that? What not that just the, the, the epitome of kindness and, you know, an extension of what we do? And, you know, you know, reinforcement based dog training isn't just about being nice to dogs or animals or it's about being kind full stop. So what a what a kind gesture. She could have easily have said, there's the local hotel motel and sort yourself out. But amazing so big shout out to her so what have you been doing to occupy your time um that was a shame because click up expo those people that don't know click up expo is done annually it's an it's done um several times a year isn't it uh twice a year twice yeah a year. yeah uh, it's a huge conference um by the karen Pryor um academy uh, where she has amazing speakers um shirag is one of them um where they it's, it's just amazing so um that was a bit unfortunate um what's the plan in terms of uh clicker expo then and um in terms of uh is it going to be rescheduled do they don't know etc etc so I think uh, Clicker Expo worked on um, providing people with the opportunity to get um, videos on on demand. So if they registered, they got to see talks from oh, wow. January because they were recorded. Right. Um, so they got to see the sessions, but just from January sessions. And then also, um, I believe they're working on dates for um, the next year's conferences. So hopefully back uh, to next fingers year, crossed, conference yeah. run as usual, fingers crossed. Yeah. yeah. So will you be speaking at that then? Um, hope so. Yeah. Uh, we'll find out soon. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so all the speakers get um, invitations and things um, sort of in the next couple of weeks and things. So yeah. we'll hopefully find out. And yeah, hopefully I'll be back at Expo um, next year as well. And will it be in the same place and same location? Um, I think the locations, I, I don't actually know the locations. Okay. I think one of the locations might be California. Okay. Um, and then I'm not sure about the second location. Okay, cool. But if you go on clickertraining.com, yeah. all the information's on there. Okay, cool. So for those of people that, um, not everybody, let's just assume, you know, foolishly don't know who you are, just give us a little bit of background of obviously where you started out, who you are, what is it that you do, and how you how you where you fit in the spectrum of dog training animal training etc just a little bit of a about shabag then okay so um i started off i wanted to be a vet since i was a young child mm -hmm. um i remember days of animal hospital watching that on tv yeah, yeah. um and then um i got to do some work experience at vet practice and then basically i just ended up staying there mm -hmm. um volunteering and then working there um and at the um uh, at the back of a, a well, I got a German. We we had family German shepherds, mm -hmm. and they used to be guard dogs and go to our businesses and uh, work there, um, and then come back home in the evenings. Um, and one of the dogs that we got, um, I was walking him down the road, and um, a week after we got him, and he grabbed hold of a guy's arm, wow. um, and um, he literally bit the guy's arm, and wow. um, so it got him off the guy's arm, and it happened again um, a couple of days later, and he used to pick used to pick up um, other do like. He 
used to stand in top of other dogs and try to shake them, go and try and bite them. Um, and so working with me, him got me interested in uh, training and behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually in the back of a veterinary newspaper, um, as an advert for a dog psychology course, you send us some money off, they wow. send you a folder and you can work through the course. And I think I was like 15, 16. So I said, we sent off the fol- um, the, um, the money, my parents gave me a check and um, they sent me a folder. I still worked through it and they sent me my certificate in dog psychology. Wow. And um, <laughs> so from that, I started running puppy classes and doing sort of one-to-ones and training classes. Uh, not the best idea, no. not the best experience. How old were you then? Um, I think as uh, by the time I started teaching classes, I was sixteen. <laughs> well, sixteen with and you had your certificate. So what more do you need? <laughs> exactly, I had yeah. a certificate in dog psychology. Yeah. Um, so I was like, I'm ready to go. Um, oh, so funny. I remember doing things that I probably would do differently now. Yeah. Um, and then um, I suppose part of it was. Um, sort of um, going out trying to find opportunities Um, so when I went to seminars I went to a few different um, I remember going to Wag and Bone Dog Show the first ever Mm -hmm. um, dog show that Beverly Cuddy put on at Dogs Mm -hmm. Today and um, I remember sitting in the marquee that they had which had it was called the Think Shrink Tank and they had different speakers speaking and Ian Dunbar was the last one I'd never even heard of Ian Mm -hmm. and I was like wow that's amazing Uh, because I was using choke chains and uh, like when Kane jumped up we'd hold our knees up yeah, so yeah. he'd run into our knee yeah. or step on his back feet mm-hmm. and so Ian changed a lot of that way of thinking for yeah. me uh, yeah. um, and then kind of developing on from there um, I uh, went into sort of doing dog, more dog training mm-hmm. um, we've always had pet birds so I was always interested in sort of exotics mm-hmm. and so started doing some training with birds um, and then went into the zoo world and oh. so I consult in um, zoos um, now laboratories um, uh, guide dogs, uh, wow. some police work, um, aquariums, uh, pet dogs. So just basically anywhere that people house animals, um, I go in and I work on helping with training and behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, and my passion is really to look at how we can improve animal welfare um, and improve the lives of the animals that we care for. That's amazing. And also help the people that care for them. So that's what I do now. That's amazing. So I'm assuming, just to assure people, you upgraded from your rubber stamp certificate. <laughs> yeah, so from my rubber stamp certificate, I did actually um, do a many, I've done many more studies mm-hmm. and I've done a postgrad certificate in clinical animal behavior at the University of Lincoln. Right. I got another grad degree in uh, bioveterinary sciences from the Royal Vet College um, and I've done other certificates in behavior analysis and I continue, I'm still doing learning. other courses. So yeah. for me, I continue learning and yes. Yeah, amazing. So just uh, taking a step back because um, the thing that I, me and Shrag have, uh, have spoken various conferences or certain conferences in the past it's a standing go- joke that I always have to define that I'm Kamal and this is Shrag because it's not common practice to see two people of our appearance doing what we do so just to, to and there's quite a lot of parallels so where well, your family um they obviously had dogs but there was a culturally a very different relationship to what you have with so how did that all start where did your passion from was it because you had the dogs in your home um just explain a little bit about that really yeah so um it was mainly my uncle, one of my uncles, um, he um, had a passion for dogs and mm-hmm. um, dogs used to, he has an off license and so he used to have an off license and so the dogs used to basically, used to always have a German Shepherd, yep. used to go to the shop, used to be a guard dog. Yep. A lot of them people couldn't, a stranger could touch mm-hmm. and, um, but they, and some of them lived in the shed in the garden yep. Um, yep. and at the end of the day um, and then in the daytime they'd be in the shop, come yep. home, live in the garden, they weren't really allowed in the house. Yep. Um, so um, all the pictures I have, like baby pictures as well um is me with the dog or me looking at over the dog on uh, try to find the dog and then um from my like when i'm could actually remember um the first german shepherd that we got um he was amazing like mm-hmm. this dog uh, max was his name mm-hmm. i remember him actually the first day getting him and coming home and this dog used to almost like walk um to the park back and no leash no yeah. nothing on he had yeah. a choke chain but never really used to use it yeah. uh, um, in the shop, he used to like be flying and screaming at people if we asked him to. But um, it all, like literally, there was no, there was a bread crate, a crate that you put bread in wow. um, at the barrier, mm-hmm. and that was the only thing that kept him back from mm-hmm. people. And um, he was an ama- amazing dog. And then we got Kane, our second, the second dog, and he's amazing as well. But he just came, and I was like, whoa, this is a very different dog. Yeah. The other dog you just do anything with, and yeah. he's this dog like grabbing older people. So yeah, um, yeah. wow, amazing. Um, yeah, it's, so it's quite, I, I find, you know, like joking aside, the fact that a lot of people grow up with dogs in the terms of, you know, their, their family pets, but like certainly culturally, I didn't, we didn't have dogs at all and nobody around us. So I always feel like 
my passion for dogs is come from I, I could get a bit deep about this but it's it's almost like it's um you know same for you there's a there's a there's something that's drawn me towards them and it has always been since day one I've been obsessed with them and obviously now I'm able to follow my passion as are you so I find that so interesting and anybody that hears you talk will, will can absolutely um hear the passion with which which you deliver your talks and the way you um you work so that's it's it's just I find it so fascinating to see people following what they love really which is um you know in itself is a um a lesson to be learned so from your initial um obviously doing your puppy classes at, um you you built that up when did you sort of become start to lecture how did that then grow to uh, you know that you obviously explained you had an interest in zoological animals but actually taking that first step how did you get your foot on the ladder so to speak to actually being involved with those industries um so um loads of good questions um so um i'm just going back to what the first question was the so how did i get involved in the zoo world yeah. and uh, what did you say before that so what it was um before? how did you go from doing your pet training to yeah. um, working with you know more you know it's a, it's a bit of a leap from doing dog training with you know getting yeah. people's dogs to sit to working with marine mammals and you know tigers yeah. and bears and all that sort of stuff yeah oh yeah yeah and then you asked about the presenting so yeah. um basically the um i started making some youtube videos um uh, for my clients mm -hmm. and it's just literally uh stuff at home just on my old phone yeah. and um upload them to youtube and uh when i made a couple of videos they people really uh, found them useful mm -hmm. and they became very popular yeah. and so that really helped and then people from that um someone emailed asking if i would go and teach a workshop mm -hmm. and um i was like oh this is interesting that's really nice but i was like i don't know what i'd actually teach uh like, why would anyone want to actually hear me teach anything i was like there's so many better people out there to teach this stuff um but they convinced me to go and teach one so that's how that kind of got started mm -hmm. um and then the more i taught the more people are like oh you have a few things to say that's slightly different or um it's a um, different perspective mm -hmm. and so um the youtube really helped with that and um and then sort of going from there and then with the zoo animals uh what happened was um my i already, always had an interest in exotics mm -hmm. and um i did bob bailey's workshops yeah, um, the chicken camps yeah. and so i went to chicken camps mm -hmm. it was like wow this animal training uh, this clicker training or this uh, dog training isn't mm -hmm. just dog training yeah. it how behavior functions yeah, absolutely uh, so it's literally from the chickens. And when I got home, I was like, oh, who can I work? Who's got animals I can work yeah, yeah, with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started trying to do as much as possible. Yeah. And it was um, helping little farms or just helping the odd collection if they've got um, a different animal. Someone yeah. had a horse and some problems. And it kind of just spread from there. Yeah, and then there was really. a wild, uh, wild zoo. Um, and then also discovered there were zoo conferences that they have yep. um so one of the zoos i was actually helping with i went and volunteered there then started helping with and doing consulting yep. um hosting a conference so i spoke at that um about some of the stuff that we're doing mm -hmm. and then from there it kind of snowballed wow, um, so that's how it's kind of built into that amazing so just give so a couple of the, uh people just pick up on shrag's points was um, anybody in an animal training, Bob Bailey is, you know, held in such reverence. He is probably the godfather of all things. You know, him and Ian Dunbar, two names that Shrags are, uh, you know, amazing. They revolutionised the way in which we perceive animal training. And the, not, certainly Ian was very public because he had a television show. Um, amazing, you know, and um, how he advocated the use of reinforcement-based methodology to train domestic dogs and, you know, aggression and et cetera was just light at the time. I can remember him coming into the four and it was absolutely like, who is this, like, you know, snake's oil skin money? It was like, oh my God, he trains, he doesn't use the check chain and he uses, you know, it was really, really... For the way in which I'm not saying that reinforcement hasn't been around in certainly in dog training, but to use it in the way that he did. And prior to that, Bob Bailey was, um, you know, is or is, I should say, as if he's passed, is um, a, a phenomenal. He trained animals from everything from arachnids to, again, for uh, marine mammals for amazing things. So if you want to do some Googling, Google Ian, Google Bob. Shrag's um, YouTube page is Domesticated Manners. Yeah. Yep. Domesticate man. If you go and uh, put on YouTube, I'll share this on the link post this video, and um, you can sh you can have a look at some of the stuff that fantastic for great ideas for puppy training, um, for teaching um, outs, teaching simple behaviours for domestic dogs, and just really really good animal training. So yeah, I'll definitely share that. So out of all the species that you've worked with, which is the one that you find most interesting or do most rewarding to train, and which is the one you find most challenging thus far? Um, that's a really good question. Um, 
I suppose I say the animal that I'm working with at the time is the one I find most reinforcing. So if I suddenly started working with giraffe or uh, with dolphins or polar bears, you're like, oh my God, I love giraffe. Yeah, so yeah, I, love yeah, yeah. I, love I must get one of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, like, I must become I Joe Exotic. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and then um, the uh, challenging wise, um, I suppose each animal that you work with, there's different challenges up mm-hmm. here. Um, I don't necessarily have one um, that I would say this has been the most, this is like, I, I'm always challenged here. Like passionate wise at the moment, and you mentioned this early on in the video today, um, was um, about community and reinforcement isn't just about non-human animals. Um, so one of the big things over the last few years I've really been trying to focus on and um, like present on as well has been applying the same science and kindness with teaching people and caregivers um you think behavior analysis and behavior science um and because there's such a big um movement in uh, it's okay to be positive with the animals or the dog yeah absolutely yeah (laughs) exactly but the people there's this idea that people should know better um so i hear trainers say um oh yeah i do that positive stuff with the dogs but actually the humans it's okay to punish them they should know better Mm -hmm. but actually it's the rules of behavior are the same whether you're a human or a dog and the clients don't know better that's why they're coming to us um and so they're looking for help and so rather than criticize them or make them feel bad Mm -hmm. which won't really change behavior yep. let's use the same techniques and tools that we have um to shape them the absolutely to... yeah i think from both so really really interesting point that i just want to dwell on in for several reasons shirag has obviously shared with us his beginnings in dog training which was compulsive mm-hmm. and we put a check chain on the dog and we did what you were told near the dog in the chest if it, that's what how all of us initially as i i talked um you know who has been in dog training i talked to janice garden and i was saying you know anybody that's really been in dog training or animal training should we say 25 30 years would have i would have confidently said certainly from a domestic point of view would have probably started in that vein you know compulsively and it was because that was how we perceived animals needed to be taught and they need there was dominance based theory that's how we were guided and it wasn't and again it's the you know that and this is getting a bit deep again it's the Maya Angelou phrase of when you know better you do better that's what we believed was the correct way to train them now you know from Shrag with his you know Kellogg's certificate and me with my naiveness we we did that because not because we went I want to be horrible to my dog because we believed that's what you had to do um and I think that you know again that's something to remind yourself and as, a, as certainly from a sports coach point of view and as a teacher I I've learned that, you know, um, you know, I in my early days of teaching, definitely, I was very much like if they were being unfair to the dog, I was being, I would absolutely jump on them from a great high, and I did it with good intentions. But now I look back and think actually my communication could have been better, um, and it's something that I think that all professionals should should remind themselves of extending kindness not only to the animal, which I think most of us that gravitate to reinforcement based dog training or animal training will absolutely sign up for that, you know, sign seal delivered. We're all about that. But I think sometimes when people come, certainly for, um, you know, if they, they come from a different way of thinking or they use technology or, or equipment that we don't necessarily agree with, the first thing that comes to our the fore is judgment. And I think that's something that we all need to be mindful of um, mm-hmm. because otherwise, and I think this is uh, several speakers that I've talked to, it just closed the doors of communication. And if we want to create a ripple beyond ourselves, then we need to be open to that discussion. I think that's something that we all need to be mindful of, certainly in this current climate, to be kind, if nothing else. Yeah, so uh, when we use a label, say, a client or teacher, um, suddenly uh, we think of that's our student. And then the way we talk to them, that's being shaped culturally. So a teacher might talk down to a child. Or um, if you say someone's a homeless person, Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly you may go, Oh, okay, when I'm walking down the street, um, it's ho- they're homeless. I'm just going to turn my head, um, as opposed to if you say that's a hu- that's another human, um, they just don't have a home, or there's a human sleeping rough, or human without um, a home. Then it go, hold on a second, it's not about a homeless person. It's it's still another person just like me or you. Um, and so that kindness of if they say any change, rather than just ignore them, mm-hmm. taking a moment to say sorry, not today, mm-hmm. um, or just how we treat that person mm-hmm. changes. And I found that for myself yeah. when I started to think about it differently it's like oh there's a person sleeping rough or there's a person sleeping um or without a home rather than just walk past when they when they're talking to you you would you'd consider that rude in any other situation yep. if someone said something yep. you just walk past yep. turn your head so why in that situation because you use that label and so i think especially with our clients as well we have to remember that every human we work with outside of the box that we call training classes mm-hmm. everyone has a life Absolutely. and so yep. when we treat someone when they come to class if we make them 
them feel bad or we say something that makes them feel judged mm -hmm. that could have a deeper impact yep. on not just the dog training yep. but how they feel how, how they themselves. go home I, people come to me and say um in a seminar or workshop sorry if i'm really loud or if i'm really giggly or if i'm the joker mm -hmm. in the class i tend to find that's my coping mechanism but when i go home at night often i end up crying myself to sleep mm -hmm. because i suffer from a lot of depression yep. and if they send that to me mm -hmm. i would never have known yeah, that yeah. Uh, yeah. but i could have judged them and said that person's so loud yeah. they're always they're yeah. always disrupting the class yeah. but they're not disrupting mm -hmm. they've got a life outside an environment Absolutely. outside of that class situation yeah. so i think that's why for me the passion of being kind to people and teach uh, treating them the way we treat our animals is so important yeah i, I think you've, you've raised so many beautiful points there and, and really put so articulately I think that the message of kindness, certainly in this current climate, is absolutely prevalent. Um, it's very easy to judge people for, uh, as you say, whether it's a past somebody on the street, etc. But the, I think kindness should be at the forefront of our mind. Um, the thing that you said about not knowing what goes behind closed doors is absolutely true. And I think certainly when we're working with dogs, often, in my experience, dogs will often be a, um, a manifestation of the person at the end of the lead both good and bad in the sense that if the person has anxiety issues often the dog will have anxiety issues and the dog can often be um a uh, an extension of the person um but by by being uh, aware of that we could, by helping the dog we're inadvertently helping the person and the other thing that that definitely has been a constant message to me is you know often certainly for sports people um, dog training or the dog sports is an escapism for a lot of them and it's the thing that they do to you know to create a social circle it's to their extended family it's where they they um, find joy it's where they find their most you know certainly for me it's where I find you know it's my happy place as it were and often we don't know what goes behind at home etc and sometimes you know if they're having a bad day with their dog because it's behaving inappropriately something that you may dust off and think oh you know he's just you know he's broken a sit or you know he's jumped up it's not the end of the world for them it's a huge deal and i think that's the the thing to be definitely be mindful of i think experience teaches you that you are when you're dealing with an animal in the con um, context of a client um, and a behavioral issue often you need to look up the lead and if you can reach them and help them and often I mean I've had somebody turn up from my door at my door to for a residential and I said you know she was very candid about the dog's behavior and I said I'm really sorry I don't think I can help you because it isn't so much the dog that um, that um, it has the anxiety and you know she was very transparent she had a very candid conversation and as a result of it you know she later it comes out she was able to sort of open up and seek help and I think sometimes in what we do you don't always appreciate the effect that you can have both positively and negatively and I think it's always mindful to operate from a place of kindness you know I think that's a good message for everybody so back to uh, the animal training and how what is it that you do um, on a daily basis now what is your bread and butter day what would your day can what would Shirag Patel normally be doing other than sunning in uh, South Carolina <laughs> so well, currently in South Carolina my day to day is I start off with a Facebook live yeah. and then um, I, we go out and play with some of Teresa's animals, the horses, the pigs, the dogs, the cat, um, and do some training. Eva Bertelsen from uh, Sweden, Carpe Momentum, is also here as well. Oh, so wow. it's like being able to geek out on training yeah, and yeah. behavior, um, all three of us. Uh, we're teaching teaching online webinars and things like that. Um, so spending time doing that. And then outside of um, life, in outside, outside of the sort of social isolation type stuff, mm -hmm. uh, my normal day to day would look a lot of teaching workshops and seminars, mm -hmm. um, consulting with um, uh, zoos, aquariums, um, organizations like the police and guide dogs. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of teaching people to t uh, teach the animals. Um, and I'm doing less um, sort of classes and private consultations at the moment. Mm -hmm. just because my travel schedule Your is schedule, crazy yeah. Yeah. um but at the moment yeah and that's what i've been focusing on um so uh, a lot of online stuff um and lots of hands-on workshops and teaching people excellent so if people want to check out any of the things that you do where can they how what's the best way to connect with you what's the best way to see what you're doing and your schedule etc uh so they can go on to domesticatedmanners.com cool. uh they can follow me on Instagram, uh, chiragpatel.co. Yep. Um, and also on Facebook, I have a page on there as well. So facebook.com, chiragpatel.co, um, it gets you to that page. Um, and that's got all the information on there as well. Excellent. So for those, just as a, um, you know, to pick your brain on a subject that you are very well versed in and very knowledgeable on is, 
behavior uh, enrichment so it, or enrichment um for animals that are unrestricted um whether it be exercise or you know if they're zoo uh, uh, zoo animals or animals in captivity i should say because some of that those principles could apply for the current climate in the sense that we might not be able to take our dogs for the extensive walk that we normally would, or we may be restricted in our, our, our travel. What can people do at home to occupy their their pets, whether it be dogs, cats, etc.? What can they do? Simple things. Um, great. That's a great question. So um, I think um, looking at ways that allow the animal to engage in things they enjoy. So if they enjoy using their nose, um, then going, oh, how can I in my living room or in my garden mm -hmm. allow them to use their nose? So some animals, we can get flower pots mm -hmm. and we can hide treats in different flower pots. Mm -hmm. um, we can start to uh, use toys like Kong toys and teach them to work through chewing the Kong toys or solving certain puzzles mm -hmm. to get um, their food out. Mm -hmm. um, could do play sessions and training sessions so uh, just spending five minutes doing something novel each day mm -hmm. um, so uh, with the Facebook lives that I've been doing each morning I've been wearing a different costume each day so I've either had a different hair on or yeah. I've had a mask on yeah. uh, or a Batman mask and so it's slightly different for the animal and then also picking um, just different games. I, I just so, got to say, Shrek, allegedly that was all in the name of dog tra animal training, the it, Batman mask. Allegedly, yes. And, um, <laughs> yeah, let's just say that. Let's <laughs> yeah, use that. Um, and then uh, like even just thinking, um, if people want to, because people are at home as well at the moment, so coming up with novel games, so if you play uh, Cards Against Humanity or things like that, um, I, the other day we played a card game and I thought, oh, how could I play this card game with my dog tomorrow? or with Teresa's dog yeah. and so I was like well what I could do is teach the dog to roll a dice and whenever the dice rolls on a certain number that's the card that I'm going to pick up and so I was playing um, a game like Cards Against Humanity with yeah. a dog. Um, Who so, won though? Uh, sorry? Who won? Who won the dog of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah so I think those kinds of things are great um, and enrich for me enrichment is anything that meets the the welfare needs of that learner um, yeah. and it could be play based it could just be uh, mental stimulation based um, so um, solving puzzles so I think of it as think of a Sudo Sudoku puzzle mm -hmm. for a human yeah. um, start off with level one if your dogs are new to it because if you start with a level 10 Sudoku puzzle yep. you might get frustrated after five minutes and yep. never want to do another one yep. whereas if you start with a level one you can build that up yep. um, other enrichment ideas could be odors so using different smells That's so if one. you have a, um, a cat bed or if you have rabbits you could put some of the rabbit uh, um, straw into a sock or into a little sack mm -hmm. and you could hang it up in different places around your house mm -hmm. and for cats or other animals even yep. dogs that's a great sensory yep. uh, way changing uh, different sensory so noise you could get different sounds that they can listen to mm -hmm. um, you could get different smells sounds touches so mm -hmm. if you find different things around your house it could be bricks it could be grass it could be astroturf mm -hmm. it could be plastic and we teach our animals just to be comfortable walking on those surfaces mm -hmm. um, that's going to help build confidence but also it's great mental stimulation yeah, great. Um, like I said food puzzles uh, different games play training um, doing different training exercises all of those things any or any of those seems to count as good mental stimulation or Amazing. training that's or so many so many great ideas there Shirag. that's absolutely fantastic so many things that you can incorporate into your animal whether it be a dog a cat a rabbit etc um that you have with you at your home that you are struggling to maybe always keep them entertained simple things they don't cost a lot of money they don't require a lot of you know they're not vast elaborate things and training skills it's just really being a bit creative look about your your home and what you've got you know those old spices that have been there for years and years and years and those herbs stick that in you know something create a nice smell again that just creates it just um invigorates the dog gives them different things that they can that are going to stimulate them and it just again it's all about exploiting the brain rather than anything you know uh, anybody that's done nose work with dogs will know you can do a little bit of nose work and your dog is wiped out for the rest of the day. It's just being creative about it. So excellent stuff. So in terms of what's your current uh, plans, obviously you're waiting to come back to the UK. I'm assuming, or are you going to just stay in South Carolina now for eternity? I love to stay. I can just stay here. Yeah. Teresa said that we could build a house on our land here. So <laughs> I, I could just take that yeah. um, option and stay here. But I do have my dog and my parrots at home. So I would like to go and see them again. But yeah. I think when things calm down um, and it's probably a bit safer to travel in aeroplanes, then I'll head back. Um, yeah. And so until then, um, I'm, like I say, just with training animals, doing um, online stuff, yeah. um, been doing some tag teach, helping uh, doing some guest um appearance and tag teach webinars oh, or, excellent. 
armed uh, Q&A. So today, uh, just in a couple of hours, we're teaching a tag teach webinar on using targets to help people learn. Um, so so uh, those than... just interjecting there, Shirag, anybody that doesn't know what tag teach is, tag teach is essentially clicker training for people and it allows people to learn very complex skills um, by giving them what you call tag points. So the person has to do a, a simple part of a movement and that movement might be part of a behavior chain for much more complex behavior. So for example, tag teach has been used to teach gymnasts, um, uh, golf technique, tennis, uh, where you just give them a piece of the movement. So they have to move from point A to point B, that would be the tag point. And then they would, again, they'd be reinforced for it until eventually that leads to uh the whole complete movement which would look like you know um you know a, a ballet move or a tennis uh, etc and it's been used for um for sports it's been used for uh, uh, people with autism or children with autism for special ill needs it's absolutely you know vastly um used and i think it's it was um it's been a break away from more conventional again a bit like animal training conventional ways of which you were taught so you know normally you were taught like you just repeat 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 and it would be you know certainly for the sports backgrounds i did you were just you know it was a little bit of drilling but tag teach is much more about breaking it down into component parts so um that's amazing that you're doing that that's fantastic how is that are you enjoying that process I'm loving it. Yeah. It's a great learning opportunity as well as getting to do some teaching and get to learn. And who better to learn from than Teresa, who's a co-founder of Tag Teach. Yeah. And so um, it's been fantastic. And you mentioned like all the different uses and she was telling us about how uh, she's been consulting. She also consulted on teaching surgeons and wow. they actually used Tag Teaching with surgeons teaching junior surgeons rather than having that high um, intensity and pressure in an operating theatre. You want to get things right and you want it to be done. So they've been using Tag Teach. So any skill wow. um, that human does, you could get, essentially use tag teach to help break it down, yeah. um, teach it in a positive way, and in a way that it doesn't confuse a learner, makes it really clear for them. Yeah. Um, so I think it's something that we should definitely look into more. Yeah, do you know the really interesting thing when you say that is how um, you said about before, one of the points was behaviour is behaviour. It doesn't matter whether it's a dog, a cat, an animal, a person is one point. And the other thing about how effective clicker training is essentially that's what tag teach is irrespective again of the species by taking the simple process of breaking behavior down into bite-sized chunks and explaining it to the, uh, the the student whether it be a dog or a person or a dolphin or a giraffe or whatever and making it achievable and reinforcing that behavior how again that how powerful that can be and how i know in my experience uh, from training dogs um, more traditionally to versus my clicker trained dogs, it, the the proficiency level and how quickly I can teach things that would have previously taken me like months and months and months, I can literally teach in seconds because of the information is so much more concise. And I think that's the thing that certainly for me, why I gravitate to that methodology, you know, and how um, consistently um, powerful it is. It doesn't matter who, what, when, etc. So I think that's what definitely ta tag teach articulates. If you can teach an animal, via a clicker to pick up a dumbbell, you can certainly teach a surgeon to do, um, you know, complex skills. So that's amazing. Um, yeah. So what else have you got? Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, and I think from your point, it got me thinking about, um, sometimes people say when I'm teaching seminars, oh, I want to use a natural approach uh, to train my animals. And for me, um, like behavior analysis or principles of behavior science, that clicker training is involved in that, all these other things, that technologies that are based mm -hmm. on a good behavior science is the most natural approach. Absolutely, because yeah. Um, yeah, it's like um, Susan Friedman uses the example of um, an apple dropping from a tree. No one made the apple drop. Mm -hmm. It drops because uh, when you live on planet Earth, yeah. gravity is a natural phenomenon. Yeah. And when we talk about these principles like positive reinforcement, um, uh, all these different things and how animals learn, um, it's, it's not a man. It's not about. Uh, we, no, we invented. haven't made this up. This is not our stuff. Absolutely. Exactly. It's, bigger than, it's bigger than yeah. the individual who. Um, uh, subscribes to that way of thinking you know reinforcement and the rules of reinforcement etc it, it's it doesn't matter whether it's an interpersonal relationship or teaching a dog to do a behavior it is the it's the stuff reinforcement builds behavior it doesn't matter what it is um and you know the laws of like you say that it, and that's the absolutely the thing to uh, to um that keeps on um for me certainly in all walks of life and it's interesting the other thing that i thought was really interesting was um again going off the beaten track about um the things that we are socialized culturally to believe so for example as a parent um a massive thing that i've become very aware of is the 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 way in which we socialize and raise our certainly 
females, girls, to believe, think and operate and therefore ad ad adhere to principles of like, um, you know, even the colour that we know that, that if you look to buy when we were go going to buy children's clothing and we made a conscious decision that we weren't going to, um, you know, have any um, strong bias, but you could not find girls cl like girls clothing or clothing for girls, I should say, that wasn't pink, didn't have Barbie. I mean, as it happens, my daughter is loves pink and sparkly things but that's just who she is as opposed to we haven't we've made a conscious decision not to have that distinct bias because um it was that that was our choice and again it's about raising somebody to think differently um and even you know um again de on a deepest subject about um um personal space so you know if she she's very she's not a kid that likes to be kissed and cut and cuddle that's just who she is and um, so I we always say, do you can will I can I give you a kiss and a cuddle? And she says no. She says not just on my head. That's the bullshit. That's who she is. But you think again, the the way in which we were brought up was well, you know, you should let me. Um, and I, there is part of that. I joke with her that I'll give your dad a kiss. Da, da, da. But I also know there's a point where she says I'm com I'm, I'm yeah. uncomfortable with that. I want her to feel strong enough to say no because that that's the thing that will hopefully keep her safe. And you look, you think of how. It's it's drip fed to people throughout their um their their whole being everything and you know when you start to it's been quite a profound experience for me to to have that brought into the forefront I mean my sister's very much into it and um with my niece and then I was like oh I was a bit cynical about it but actually you go do you know what it's those little subtleties like as a, 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 you know she should let me but hang on a second in years to come I don't want her to have that principle with every Tom Dick and Harry so to speak yeah. but if you're told it constantly and it thinks this, the parallels that I take is what we um certainly with animal training we were very much I think that's changed a lot but you know the dog should do it because it's told to do it you know um and there's been shifts in animal training it's just as you said about um being aware not only about the animals but also how we are with each other i think that was a really really articulate point well yeah and like this rabbit hole i love this because uh one of the things you mentioned there was the how we speak to children and things like that and then also the touching aspect and if you think about dogs and puppies people say um they'll come to me because they go oh well my dog's got something wrong with him or the puppy's got something wrong mm. he doesn't like being touched yeah. um I was like, oh, that but why should he? Exactly. Yeah, why should yeah, he certainly. expect? Yeah. Why should he? A total that? stranger. You, yeah. Have you built that respect? Have you taught him how to be touched? And uh, people are like, no, he's a dog. He should be touched. And I think, hold on a second. If you think about humans, if you go to two different massage therapists, you have to learn, and you either gonna like and dislike yeah. the touch that yeah. you get. How can a dog be born knowing how every single human hand is yeah. going to feel? Yeah. That's something they have to learn. Yeah. So you can't just go and touch every dog and yeah. go, well, the dog's going to like being touched. That's abnormal. Yeah. We have to teach this yeah. uh, because humans have to learn touch. And then the other thing that you mentioned with the um, even just how you speak to kids or ask questions, I just wanted to bring up um, just uh, the people who are listening might be interested. Um, so after the first expo um, in January, uh, which was in Seattle, mm -hmm. um, we got to go to um, a few of us went and spent some time at Morningside Academy, which mm -hmm. is a school that uses a lot of behavioral technology mm -hmm. to teach the students. Mm -hmm. And it was phenomenal. Like we followed Joanne, the principal around um, for the day. She'd walk into a classroom and it, it, we would go near a child and she would say to a child, Hi, I've got some guests with me here. These are who they are. Is it OK if we stand and just watch you do some work? for a minute if you want to say no that's completely fine yeah. and the way the language and the kids called her joanne rather than head teacher or mm -hmm. miss mm -hmm. something um and um just to watch that relationship and watch the respect that mm -hmm. she had for the kids what the kids had for her yeah. um and even when i say kids the label of child a kid mm -hmm. we would treat them differently because we associate that label mm -hmm. whereas if we said younger human or yeah. a younger person mm -hmm. then we go hold on a second i wouldn't do that to an older person yeah. why would that do why would i do that to yeah. a younger person yeah. so i love that rabbit hole that you mentioned I yeah think it's such we a... could really go down a rabbit hole because you know what it's been really i i'm constantly having these thoughts in my head recently of since being a parent about and we visited schools um which actually very much go along that principle and it was just mind-blowing to see the way in which they engage with their kids and therefore also like because they had kids there from uh, tiny kids to um just before they went to secondary school and the the way in which they interact with the staff was absolutely amazing like apps was respectful was kind was courteous but because the way in which they um you know uh they were uh, i don't want to say raised but you know, how they were interacted with just consistently 
um like again it was about do you mind this is and exactly that they introduced us we were strangers and you think yeah it's that whole um what we again we're indoctrinated to believe isn't it well i i'm a stranger i'm with this person you should allow me it's like but if you think of that if that was somebody at the park let's just say i was at my door and there was a stranded person come up and just loomed over your kid you'd be really really concerned and it's that and it's and it's not about saying not we, no, we can go to the extremes of political correctness and it's just saying just checking is it okay are you happy because not all kids are going to like that coming back right. to your point about socialization one of my m biggest bugbears is the need for people to allow their puppies to be handled by a thousand people because their puppy should and some puppies great they're really gregarious they love it my personal feeling is that's counterproductive because I personally want my dogs to be indifferent to people. I don't want them to be excited by them or animated per se by strangers. I just want them to be like, you know, nonchalant. That's my goal. So I try to avoid people, um, you know, overhanding them because uh, certainly throughout their whole, their, their their first year, I'd say, if not longer, they're so susceptible to one negative experience could absolutely be a catalyst for a long-term behavioral um, uh, problem. So I'm really protective about the, the exposure my puppies have i don't do see this person see this person you know in, and have people um and it's always very um controlled so that they have the right exposure and i think that's something that you again you've said it's so important to think of those details isn't it Shabag? for the long term isn't it really you know definitely you have to think about the long term and i think for me socialization is that quality as opposed to Absolutely. that quantity um and so it's like what do i want if i break down the construct of socialization it's actually one of the talks i gave at expo this year was um rethinking socialization and uh, what does socialization actually mean um and when you break it down what are we trying to achieve what Absolutely. social skills what behaviors yeah. how are we trying to teach them yeah. and so, uh, definitely i think we need to be thoughtful when we think about socialization and Absolutely. everyone you have a perspective on socialization I have a perspective. Mm -hmm. Lots of people have different perspectives mm -hmm. on socialization. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, when we start becoming thoughtful about those perspectives yep. and going, um, let me think about them rather than just doing what everyone says or yep. what's in a book, let's just consider, let's see what the science is and then let's just start thinking about this yep. and then see what we come up with. I think there's been so many shifts, isn't there? You know, originally it was your dog must be seen and not heard. And then it was your dog has to meet 50 people and 50 things in a day. And now it's much more about appropriate. And like you said, and I think certainly for people with puppies at this current client time who are concerned about their dog not meeting 50 people, relax, it's going to be fine. You know, as long as you are mindful about the experiences and I use the term appropriate socialization and your dog is having an experience that's beneficial. So they're meeting a dog an older dog that they have to be a little bit respectful of. They're meeting a younger dog that can play and, and, and teach them about, you know, social skills and interaction. They're meeting a smaller dog, that etc., or a dark dog or a hairy dog. So each lesson has a, a value to that dog's long term temperament, I think is far more beneficial than saying, let me meet 150 dogs that, you know, you don't know their response, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So really, really, really powerful. I think that's great that you've reiterated that. Um, thank you. Yeah, very much. and I think. I think that, uh, it's important for puppies to meet a variety of people and a variety of dogs. And like, I don't think it needs to be overkill. Yeah. And like you say, I think it's if you do a thousand people, um, but they have uh, many bad experiences in that as well yeah. as good experiences for both. And so I think it's a balance of um, making sure the puppies do meet people um, and meet other dogs, but also uh, make sure that they're learning the skills and the behaviors that we want them to to practice Absolutely. and to learn. The Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's a huge takeaway for anybody that Shrag's advice um, and saying, you know, if you, you know, and, and again, to reiterate that to back what, up what Shrag has said is, you know, if you have got a puppy at this moment in time and you are, oh, I've lost you. Uh, one second, Sorry. where am I? Sorry, there we That's go. That's all right. Um, if you do have a puppy and you are concerned about, you know, not being able to get it out as you normally would, it relax. Again, it's about quality, as Shrag said, rather than quantity. So a great advice. So any final um, thoughts about, um, you know, the, the, the what people can do to keep themselves up? But you've mentioned about dog training. How about just in general, any thoughts about the current, how you as on a personal level dealing with the, you're obviously having a great time. Um, but for those that, um, how, any thoughts about that? Well, I've been, um, for my situation, I've been practicing mindfulness, um, maybe listening to a podcast on uh, some meditation stuff and um, just um, around, surrounding my environment. So um, in the morning, I'm going to have, um, I'm going to start off with a podcast and something to do with mindfulness, something about calmness, inspirational type stuff, oh, uh, self-defense. 
self-care and then later on in the day i might uh, devote uh, five minutes or ten minutes to going okay i'm going to read the news yeah. um but after that um that's it i'm not going to keep going oh yeah. there's another news alert there's right. another news alert right. so i'm going to arrange my environment yeah. to promote um self-care behaviors yeah. as well as um sort of focusing on so you're still realistic you're still living in the real world yeah. but you can arrange your environment to go i'm going to set up by doing these things Absolutely. about having the tv on at this time or yeah. this time and doing these and also i can pr use this time to connect with friends using zoom yeah. or to do things that i haven't had a chance to do otherwise yeah. and so i wanted to do a course on coursera i haven't had a chance to do that well i can suddenly start doing that yeah. so i think um, they would be my final oh, words that's, or, that's fantastic yeah. advice about mindfulness and it's also about taking a little bit of um you know self-care and a little bit of responsibility for the the things that you in, you put into your system whether it be you know a podcast that you listen to or being conscious about how you you engage with other people or uh, and certainly you know um policing the um what you expose yourself to i think that's all fantastic advice Shrag, it's been absolutely fantastic you are always engaging to talk to always kind you you walk the walk and talk the talk in terms of the way in which you conduct yourself thank you very much for taking this well nearly an hour to talk to me i very much appreciate it um best wishes look after yourself in south carolina i hope you get home at some point thank you very much and thank you so much for spending the time today as well no, no it's been great talking to you no worries take care look after yeah. yourself see you later bye, bye.